Hey friend, welcome. Paul Shaw with you for another episode of The Shaw Show. Firstly, just a really quick reminder. Our mission, it's pure and simple. We want to help you to make positive and sustainable improvements to your career, your health and your life by providing you with access to interesting and inspiring thought leaders across those three broad categories. And please, if you're enjoying the show, Do share it with your family, friends and colleagues, which you can do directly from iTunes. It helps us a lot and we'll be eternally grateful. And finally, if you can leave us a comment so we better understand what's resonating with you and how we can improve, that too would be greatly appreciated. Our guests today are Jess Ellum, the CEO, and Aaron Thompson, the CMO of Zupa, a new breed of disruptive superannuation solution for the Australian investor. The company's manifesto includes a pledge to put the power in the hands of the people and shifting it away from the establishment that may or may not have your best interests at heart. The company is aiming to deliver the best possible super experience at the lowest possible price point from day one. And the size of the prize really is enormous and Zupa would seem to have a value proposition which really does position it well to capitalise on this opportunity. If you're into wealth creation and preserving your wealth, then it's a really fascinating and important conversation. So sit back and enjoy and let me introduce Jess and Erin. Cool. Jess, Erin, welcome. Thanks for having us. Hey. I want to start by talking about both of you guys individually. When you're setting up a, a super fund, Interesting, and we're going to talk a bunch about that later. But in terms of where you've come from professionally, and and what brought you to to the idea, and how long that idea has it been in evolution, and all those kinds of meaty things. Cool. Well, uh, I mean, the idea for Zuber is something that that um, we've been working on for over a year. They're not, you know, the industry doesn't just let anybody who wants to start a superannuation fund jump out and tell the world they're going to do that. There's a mm-hmm. lot of regulatory hurdles you have to go through, and a lot of um, partners and people and they have to have in place to make sure that anyone who puts their money into your fund is going to um, know that their money is safe and protected and smartly invested. So it's been a long journey. We've been doing this for <clears throat> almost 14 months yeah. you know, from from initial idea to um, actually having a wait list site up and um, being ready to launch in almost a few in sometime in August. So it's been a long journey um, and, but part of the way we got here was, uh, you, met, you asked about background, so part of the way that we got here was uh, one of our other co-founders, John Holloway, and I uh, both come out of Adland and we both have uh, strong backgrounds in marketing and strategy and technology and innovation mm-hmm. and we uh, had been working in that industry for a long time, sort of reached you know high levels of achievement and success in that industry, and we're looking at that, and looking for other opportunities and other ways we could use our skill sets. And if, the way I often talk about it is, we we use our strategic and creative brains to try and sell more soap or get people to use more data on their mobile phones or yeah. buy a new car, right? And those are legitimate, you know problems to solve to help make the financial world and the economy function properly. But we wanted to try and broaden the lens and see if we could use that same kind of thinking to solve bigger problems and look at bigger industries that are too big, too stuck, too old to change and adapt to the way the world works today. Yeah. Right. And so out of that journey, we created a, a business called Antidote, which sort of became like a small sort of incubator or uh, uh, a, um, a oh, business, if you will, that allowed us to look at and explore those types of opportunities. And off the back of that, we were introduced to our other co-founder uh, who was working in the financial business already and saw an opportunity in superannuation suggested that we take a look at it. Yeah, okay. And so we did that and now here we are. Okay, cool. Jess, what about you? So I first met these guys in January. So they reached out to me. So my background is fintech. So I pretty much went into fintech before it was even called fintech. So about six years ago, I joined a company called Tyro. And Tyro was one of the first challenges in that space to actually take on the banking sector and say... Payments? Payments, yeah. yeah. So say you could deliver a better product using a new technology stack. So we went into that market, I think, a little bit naively. It took 10 years to actually break even and get profitable. But there were a lot of, I think, very forward-thinking people that invested into that business. And 
since we broke out of the payment sector, we actually took on the full banking sector. And during my time at Tari, we got a full banking license. So that business really showed me that you can really take disruption to that space. Mm. And yes, these businesses are very staid and they're very stuck in their ways to Aaron's point. And they're very big, which can kind of seem very scary. You know, a lot of people would look at that and say, well, why even bother? They've got very deep pockets. Don't even try. But actually what we learned is we built a very profitable, successful business at Tyro. And it kind of showed me that disruption is possible. If Mm. you have the right idea, you find the right niche and you have a really creative and technology driven approach to, to the market. Yeah, so sure. when I these guys in January and they were sort of convincing me to come on board and join them um, as a, in, in the super industry, it wasn't something that I actually ever really thought about. And when I drilled into that, I thought, that's the exact problem. I've yeah. never even thought yeah. about my super. Like, this is a fundamental issue with this sector. Why don't I think about it? And then that kind of kick-started my own self-discovery phase into my own superannuation. Yeah. You know, so I kind of suddenly checked my balance in my account, which I'd never done before. I started looking at the fees that I was paying I started kind of questioning hey actually where is my money invested is it easy to find out and all of these things were hurdles in my way to actually to enlightenment and I think that was when the penny dropped for me and I thought wow there's very few people doing anything about this problem. The industry um, doesn't really seem to care. I mean, I'm sure they say they do, but I don't really feel like they're talking to me. Mm. So I think that was when I thought, yeah, this is kind of like the next Tyro. Like, here's Tyro's gone through that journey already. Here, superannuation, we can do the same with super. Yeah, and we'll talk a bunch about the super industry. And obviously, there are the good, the bad, and the ugly. And and I agree with you. I, I worked in finance for, for 15 odd years and I was the same. I never looked at it. I go, ah, if, if I'm not looking at it and I don't understand it, fee structures and platforms and wraps and all this language, then what hope has, you know, the average non-financial unsophisticated investor got? You know, so that's what I thought with, with today, guys, that... In terms of an assumed audience, and no doubt there's going to be some sophisticated people that listen to it, there are going to be some of your investors and things, is really to try and demystify, which I imagine is one of your missions with, with, with your business, so that the, the average person can better understand the industry as a whole, some of the competitive advantages of Zupa and I suppose some of the pitfalls. And it was funny because last night I was watching The Inside, you know, the, that wonderful documentary that Matt Damon narrated about the, the GFC and Wall Street. And, and I was sitting there with my girlfriend, who's an incredibly intelligent girl, comes out of marketing. And I looked at her about half an hour and her eyes were just glazed over. And I looked at her another hour and I said, are you enjoying this, sweetie? And she goes, I don't know. I don't understand one thing that they're talking about and they had paired it back to the bare basics and I don't think that's a reflection on KB in any shape or form it's just that the financial world is so full of jargon and sophistication that for most people it's it's incredibly daunting. Lots of lots of weird acronyms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like superannuation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just retirement savings, right? Yeah. It's retirement savings. It's an investment. It's your money. A forced investment that you are forced in this country to give to someone that you're meant to trust. And I think that's the big challenge for a lot of people is they don't know where the money's going to. They don't know whether they believe in the investments that the company's making, let alone how much they're actually generating in terms of a return and yeah so can we just maybe start with the the superannuation the australian superannuation industry in so far as you know looking at the size of it where you know the difference between the active and the the, the low cost index funds and and etfs and things like that and and i suppose a little bit of commentary around the difference between fund managers and hedge funds and PE funds and those kind of things that a lot of us assume that people understand and and but for the average person really doesn't understand the difference between those those kinds of organizations 
Sure. Yeah, I mean, so it's a $2.3 trillion industry today and it's growing exponentially year on year. It's one of the biggest forced or compulsory savings schemes in the world. What's it right now? Is it 9%? 9.5. And what's the scale? Like? What's oh, it's going to go up. So I think it's going to go up to about 12%, 12 yeah. you know. So, the, you know, the government's very keen for us to be putting more into our super because there's no question that as a society we're aging yeah. and the budget isn't going to be able to support us on mm-hmm. the standard pension scheme. So there's a big incentive for us to put more into our into our super but again I think when you ask people to put more into something they A don't understand or B get any value from perceived there's a lot of pushback on that so it yeah. keeps getting delayed so I think huge industry there's about 14.8 million I think super people in Australia that have superannuation yeah. but to understand how broken the industry is bear in mind that there's 30 million superannuation accounts out there so basically on average Australians have two superannuation accounts yeah. for which they're paying two sets of fees to active managers that they've never met who are investing their money in things they don't really understand and secondary to that um, they're paying insurance fees and a whole bunch of other useless administration fees that are eating away their super balance and I mean it's not uncommon I think Erin you've had this experience right to basically stop contributing to a super fund then turn around and check it a year later and there's pretty much nothing left in it right yeah I mean that's part of what got me really excited about the opportunity to disrupt this space was I had an experience when I first moved to Australia where I didn't fully understand what superannuation was like a lot of people who are from here still don't mm-hmm. you know and uh, yeah I got a letter one day uh, saying sorry we have to close your account there's no money left in it and I didn't even know I had this account you know and when I did some research and digging around at one point there was over 10 grand in this account great. that just got nice. eaten up with fees every month and this is their, and that's them managing my money <laughs> I'm like you just managed all my money into your pocket you know and then told me I couldn't, you know, when I didn't have any left that uh, you were done with me yeah. and so yeah so I've, I've had that little boiling resentment you know towards the industry for a long time and so yeah to the opportunity to disrupt that space and try and solve that problem is really appealing so on that the, 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 the historically the typical fee structure for an active fund manager has been they will earn two percent of funds under management and then 20 percent of returns over uh, an agreed index is that correct in probably the broader industry, yes. Yeah. In the super industry, those fees are starting to come down, so there's sure, been a lot of pressure on the sector. But to only very in. recently. Only very recently, yeah. yeah. Now, so Rice Warner came out recently and had this big figure: two point three billion dollars in fees that Australians have been paying. You know, where's it all going? Well, it's definitely enriching a certain part of the sector. And I think if you look at is any of that money being invested back into making super products better? No, not really. So if you look at the superannuation industry as a whole, there's over 200 funds out there. There was a report done last year that looked at how many of those funds had apps, for example. How long's the iPhone been around? Over 10 years? Yeah. 10 super funds had an app. Yeah, you know? most, most of them don't work. Super funds. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of like, what have all these people been doing all this time with all this money? Well, they've been quite happy to just, you know, take it, invest it where they want to invest it mm. and keep their active management kind of portion of their base happy but at the end of the day what value are we seeing in, in terms of having better control and engagement over our money yeah. yeah the industry as a whole basically has this philosophy like what we call big super right mm. they're, they're, they're they're basic operation op, operating standard operating procedure is basically you know Get, that, get your money in and then don't talk to you, right? Their philosophy is a disengaged customer is a good customer. Yeah. The less you think about super, the less likely you're going to ask them to do anything. Mm-hmm. You're going to ask questions or potentially roll your money out of their fund into someone else's, yeah. right? And so at Zuber, we're taking a complete opposite approach. We think people deserve to know what their money is invested in. They deserve to um, get the best value for that money. And, um, we, and they deserve to be... Um, have a relationship with a business that talks them in their language, that breaks it down into easy to understand terms, that makes it easy for them to choose where and how their money is invested. Yeah. So we're flipping that whole thing on its lid, and basically, we, you know, our philosophy is an engaged customer is a good customer, and uh, we want to have that kind of um, solid, trusted, ongoing, and reliable relationship with the people who join our fund and become members. Yeah, I completely agree. Like I've got not a significant amount of money, but en- enough money in super to, to worry about it. And, you know, it's in a wrap platform that's then managed by an active manager. So there's fees going to the platform, there's fees going to the, the manager. And recently with Donald Trump and all this political unrest that we've got, I decided I was going to park all my money in cash because I'm really nervous about where the world's going 
And it took me literally three months to get all of that money into cash. And some of it was human error and just sheer laziness. And some of it was they've just got rules and regulations around run on money and to protect themselves, not to protect our money. Mm. And I just thought it was absolutely diabolical. And there was never one... And it was MLC rap. I'm going to name and shame them because I thought it was absolutely disgraceful. <laughs> Did they make a set of facts? Oh, you know, what I'd be good off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still good. People, yeah. you know telling us stories like they tried to roll over and they had to send a fax and fill out a form and it was just all too hard and so they don't you know and that's again one of the interesting things about the timing of of the business we're building is that the technology is on our side yeah. so like um you don't have to send a fax machine to roll into zuber you don't have to do it we can roll you into our fund in under a minute you know yeah, you can wow. do it all online on your phone you know yeah. and um, and that's that's the and you know the big super isn't doing that yeah. you know yeah. as just said maybe out of 300 or so super animation companies in Australia 10 of them have tried to build apps none of them are any good you yeah, know wow. and um, so there's a real opportunity to yeah. disrupt just on t- just using the technology that exists in the world today and yeah. applying it to that sector there yeah. are kind of three forces that we looked at and you know we are communicating to our investors as well um, one of those is regulatory so mm. to, to your point um, you know they'll do as much as they can to make it hard but actually the ATO and the government now wants to make it a lot easier for Australians to move their super yeah. so there's this thing called uh, called super match which essentially allows you to roll over completely online so within within seconds once you've entered your TFN into the super portal we'll find all of your super accounts and we'll give the option to consolidate all of them into super or some of them it'll be up to you yeah. so that's an important regulatory piece that has made super a, a viable business at this yeah. point in time the second is social so if you look at what's happening in the market especially with the millennial generation kind of becoming a lot more powerful in terms of um, buying power and leverage in this space yeah. uh, they're also very distrusting of the financial sector you know they lived through the GFC they saw their p- parents potentially being exposed to some of the kind of issues that happen at that time. Yeah. They're actually quite um, conservative in many ways and they are quite financially um, savvy. savvy, but yeah. they just don't have the tools yet to really make things happen in an easy way. So they're very attracted to, to new brands and they're not afraid of working with new brands that maybe don't have a 100-year track record in terms of trust, but potentially have a um, have a brand purpose that, that can equate to trust. So they look at Zuper and they go, great, these guys want to do something different. They want to give me back control and help me make a difference. That resonates with them. Yeah. And the third thing, to, to kind of Aaron's point and your point, the technology is now so cheap and available off the shelf that we can build um, tech stacks from the build end and the front end and marketing end that these super funds can't even dream of doing in their current structures. They're just not agile enough. Yeah, get it, get it. And the... Looking at the other, like things like hedge funds and private equity funds, just so that people that, that aren't sophisticated, the the difference between those and, and super funds, because again, I think like hedge funds is a classic example, and I saw a, an article the other day, and this, this was the top 25 global hedge funds that there was $14.5 billion in earnings to the, the top 25. You know, a couple of individuals earn over a million, a billion dollars each. And more than 25% of those funds are less than the S&P 500 index. You know, it's just, it, it seems like, again, there's this outrageous pool of money chasing returns and the, the real winners out of that are the, the fund managers that have negotiated these historical fee structures that they take all the reward and none of the risk. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Peter Costello has gone on record and said 90% of active managers can't outperform the market, right? So great if you can find the 10% that do and you've got deep pockets to pay for them. And absolutely, there's a place for active managers. You know, there are some very skilled people out there that can spot opportunities, right? It's almost like an art. But if you look at where you should be and where the whole market is moving, especially globally, people are going index funds people are thinking ETFs that's where the money is heading because not only can it return the return the market yeah. but there's no you know an active manager has to return the market and some and some more to justify their fees yeah. so I think investors are kind of waking up and going well if I'm going to put my money somewhere I should probably put it in you know the lowest cost option that has the highest possibility of getting me a decent if not good return yeah and I think that's part of the problem when you look at a lot of and the 90% that you're speaking about because there, there are some fund managers that I know that are incredibly 
intelligent, incredibly savvy and have performed for a decade or more and outperformed the index. But the 90% that don't, they're literally just hugging the index anyway. Correct. So they're charging your premium fees and yet they're hugging the index. And I think BT is a classic example of that. that. You know, I've followed those guys for a long time and I look at their performance and at best they're hugging the index. Most of the time they're significantly below it. Mm-hmm. And yet their fee structure is is really draconian in their favour. Yeah, I mean it's just uh, the historical data proves that you know passively passive index funds and passive ETFs outperform uh, you know a managed actively managed fund over time mm-hmm. almost always. And you know if, for anyone listening who doesn't even understand that vernacular, it, the, in simplistic terms, what it means is that your money is invested. Someone that you probably haven't met is making decisions about where that money is being invested and the types of investments they want to make, and and w- which also could be, by the way, things that you don't want it to be invested in, like weapons or coal or tobacco gambling. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, and they're basically, and you mentioned gambling. They're actually gambling. They can beat the market, right? And you pay them whether they do it or not. You know, so if they win, you're up, but you still have to pay them. If they lose, you're down, and you still have to pay them. Mm-hmm. And so. So there's that cost, but it, where it gets really damaging over long term is that money, whatever those fees are, as small as they might seem on the day or every month or every year when you get your annual statement, over a period of 20, 30, 40 years that your superannuation is working hard for you, that money doesn't get reinvested. So you're losing a tremendous uh, amount of compounding returns on that money. And that's, it's significant. And it's significant in yeah. the long term, right? And I think that's the other thing is a lot of people think like, oh, well, you know, this particular super fund had a good year, they're up, um, so maybe I'll put my money there. But it's a long game, right? Mm-hmm. This is this is a, this is a, a, the long tail here. So we don't want to you, you don't want to make your snap decisions based on what's happening in the market right now. Yeah. You want to look at it at the long term. You've got to look at the fundamentals of the portfolio construction, and for us, that's about making it really basic. So we'll invest in ETFs that cover a bunch of different asset classes, so you diversify yeah. and you spread your risk across you know the majority of the market. Yeah. And then with 20% of your portfolio, we'll say you can self-direct that. You say where it's going to be invested. Yeah. We'll still use ETFs, so you still get that diversification. But hey, do you care about health and wellness, or do you care about clean energy or do you care about the environment and why don't you self-direct some of that money into those or technology even put it all in one sector with your 20% or split it across a few yeah so and we're jumping around a little bit here but am I right in saying it's almost the the benefits of a a self-managed superannuation fund without the the cost and the compliance burden of doing that yeah in many ways people have, have likened that because we are giving people Control. The interesting thing about self-managed super funds, if you look at the data, like a lot of people are excited about that, you know, and get think, you know, they get frustrated for whatever reason with whatever their money's doing or not doing, and you know, where it currently is, they decide to open a self-managed super fund. They take the money out. Hopefully, it doesn't take them three months like it took you to convert yours to cash, but yeah. eventually they get it out, and then they put it in a savings account until they figure out what they're going to do, yeah. and then they don't do anything. Yeah. So they're actually losing in the long term, and yeah. there's a tremendous amount of people in that situation. So with Zuper, what's really cool Cool is it gives you just enough controls that, um, but without um, without you kind of having to all of a sudden skill up and learn, as, you know, become a financial wizard to make yeah. what yeah. you feel are safe, smart decisions. Yeah. So when we launch, we'll have um, we'll have four funds. We'll have a kind of a basic growth fund. We'll have a technology fund, which will give you exposure to international brands like Apple and Google and Tesla and all these kind of world leaders. Yeah. We'll have a, a green technology fund, which will give, be focused on clean energy and you know, ethical investments. And then we'll have a health and wellness fund. So, and then the other, the idea is that we'll be able to almost kind of crowdsource what the next funds we open Mm -hmm. inside of Zuper will be, right? So people tell us they're really interested in property. Can we create an ETF, a low-cost ETF that kind of gets them access and exposure to property funds? Um, Agriculture, Australian only. We're really excited about one that we're looking at right now, which is businesses, uh, creating a fund that's built around businesses that have female CEOs. Um, So we're open and excited about the kinds of things that we can build. And it's all about kind of reflecting our members interest back so that they can feel like their money's yeah. put where their passions are. Yeah, and can I play devil's advocate for a minute in terms of the investment side of it? That 
Jess, I get you come from fintech. Erin, you come from, from advertising and marketing. Where are you getting that core competency or are you outsourcing that or... Yeah, so that's a really important point, I think, to cover. And, you know, as Erin said, it's been a 14-month journey, right? You don't just get let in the door when you say, I want to make a super fund. There's a lot of regulatory players in the background that you, A, have to have relationships with and, B, have to have um, signed contracts in place to get this thing off the ground. So we've spent a lot of time investing in those partnerships and kind of taking them on the journey because if you think about it, they're very used to working with the the old guard, right? So we we represent something a little bit new and different. And there's a lot of models around how we go to market that are very different that they have to get comfortable with. So it's kind of education on both sides. But in, in, in what we would often say when we're talking to the world is that we've actually de-risked the business by working closely with these partners mm. because they're absolute gurus, right? So you have to have a trustee that knows everything about what's going on in superannuation. Yeah. Trustee that we're working with has $8 billion under management already in super and can you know facilitate all of the entry points for us and make sure that we're covered from that perspective. Can you, can you mention who that is? We're not mentioning them yet, so it's part of the next phase when we launch. Okay. The, other, the other party to that is an administrator and a Again, they manage the whole platform in terms of where the investments sit and the portfolios. Again, deep expertise. And one of the reasons why we chose the administrator that we went with is because they were actually already gearing up for the next phase of Super. So Super 2.0, which a lot of people in the industry are calling it, whereby they have interfaces into their platform that are what what we would say are API ready. Mm -hmm. So we can say we can build a back end and make API calls into there that allow us to deliver up the awesome front end that we want to that, that has that experience of being able to engage and see your super and pretty much real time and so the third piece to that is the investment piece and Christian who's in our team is fantastic he comes out of funds management and he deeply understands that space so when we were designing our portfolios it was a combination of saying Okay, Christian, let's use your expertise here because that's what you do for a living. Where did he come from? So he comes from venture capital himself and funds management. So he understands intrinsically what's right and what's wrong with the space from an investment perspective. We work with him to develop the portfolios and then we work with an asset consultant to actually go, hey, is this legit? Mm. Can we find better, cheaper, more efficient products to go in this portfolio? And they then prepare reports around setting investment objectives, stress tests, and we continue to work with them on a quarterly basis. So there's an, an incredible amount of stuff that happens behind the scenes that we shield all of our members from, sure. but is absolutely critical to maintaining a viable and, like, I suppose, regulatory compliant business. We yeah. definitely don't take that for granted. Checks and balances yeah. are in place. Yeah, yeah. Get it. Sure. And is it going to be long only investments or long, short, neutral? What's the. So it's interesting, right? I mean, super is a long-term investment and the ETFs that we're investing in across a basket of different companies, quarterly we review those, right? So it's important to take stock on a quarterly basis, how those investments are performing and then adjust if necessary. So that's absolutely part of our philosophy. But I mean, in terms of, you know, there are certain funds that that are betting that stocks are going to go up, long funds, some, some... There are many companies in Australia that that a bunch of their stock is short sold because there are a bunch of investors that believe they're going to go down, so they've short sold them. So is your fund only, or the platform only going to be invested in long-only stocks? MVP, yes, absolutely, yeah, because part of that philosophy around keeping it simple, using the products available on the market, there aren't a lot of ETFs that short the market at this point, although we are starting to see some Some. come out. Um, So I think that's something we'll, we'll keep looking that you know we want to get the best portfolio possible for our members that delivers the best return yeah. so if it turns out that that's something that we should be doing then we'll definitely be considering it yeah and tell me given where we are in the economic cycle and and i know a lot of people way smarter than i am are, are, are saying one they're nervous about the influence of the likes of trump etc but two that we are way past what would be a typical cycle for a bull run you know, we really have since 2000 and end of 2009, 2010, been on an upward trajectory and particularly in the US, you know, Australia is still not back to where we were in, in 2006, 2007. But is there concerns as you launch the fund around launching virtually at the top of the market? 
It's an interesting question. Um, I think it's something every single super fun faces. It's mm. not unique to Zupa. I no, think, of course not. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, market dynamics are incredibly important and we think about them a lot and we talk to our investment consultants daily about that because that was a big part of the driver. How do we structure funds that, in a way, are ready for wherever the market is heading next? Yeah. And I think, you know, no one's got a crystal ball. That's just, that's, you know, we can take punts on what's going to happen. But what we can do is we can say, well, we're going to invest in a growth portfolio. So we're going to invest in those companies that potentially are about to ride another wave. And I think that's when we look at those tilts and there's some really exciting up and coming companies in there, which I think investors in in our fund, when we, you know, fill them in on what's going on in those tilts, because they're absolutely going to want to know the companies they're invested in, can start to kind of make their own decisions. And again, it's about giving them choice. Mm. They're not, um, you know, a lot of people are quite aware of what's going on in the market you know they're not as maybe um shrouded from it as what a lot of other super funds might think and i think those tilts will be really interesting in helping them position themselves for growth yeah interesting interesting and are you in a position yet to talk about the fee structure and we absolutely know what it is we're probably not in a position to say exactly but to give you an indication of kind of the philosophy, yeah. best experience at the lowest possible price point that we could achieve, that's yeah. market leading. Yeah, and I think we're pretty, we're there, right? I yeah, mean, we're there. No, we're, we're there. there and um, when we announce those fees, uh, they will be substantially lower than any other new entrants into the space. Yes. Well, let's talk a little bit about them because I've been intrigued by spaceship and grow in particular probably more so spaceship because i think it's been it's it's had a lot of press it's got some very high profile investors but i look at it as uh, unsophisticated investor in, in in many regards and say it's a really great marketing exercise They're positioning themselves as a fintech company and they won a fintech award I saw recently. When you look under the hood, it doesn't really look like the technology is proprietary or anything sophisticated. And then you've got a team of incredibly unexperienced or inexperienced investors that are are taking the investment role also on the one side and then grow... I don't quite understand because unlike Spaceship, they've outsourced their the investment side to Dimensional. So are we just not adding another layer of fees with a little bit of technology to a service that people could access already? So be really interested in your views on both of those companies in particular and, and how you're differentiated from them. Look, I think the biggest way that we're different from anyone else in the, that's come into the space recently, and we're all, we've all kind of arrived at the same time, and part of the reason that we've all arrived at the same time and why we're all mentioned in the same sentence in every piece of PR and article that's come out in the last few weeks is because as the, as the new super disruptors is for all the reasons we've talked about, the technology and the mm-hmm. timing and all that stuff, is there's a reason why it's happening now. We couldn't have launched this business a year ago because the technology and the legislation wasn't in place to do that. Okay. So now we're all here. And we all, we are all bringing something unique and different to the market. But the one of the probably one of the most uh, important and biggest ways that we're different from anyone else that's come into the space is that we are the only um, superannuation fund that has this passive uh, passively managed philosophy, index funds and passive ETFs. No one else is doing that. Yeah. Okay. And that's what allows us to get our fees so low. Yeah. Okay. So the other two, well. Grow, I don't understand at all because what I do understand, it just it just seems like another layer of fees. So Dimensional's doing the the investment side of it for them. So why you why you don't just go to Dimensional, I don't know. But um, space spaceship, the they're they're, they're doing their in house advice themselves. So they're doing the direct investment as an active manager. Yeah. As far as we know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. from what we can tell. I mean, it, it is a bit grey, right? It we is we very can't gray. really understand. Yeah. I think that's another core element of our business is transparency, right? Yeah. The industry is grey enough as it is. It's already difficult enough to navigate. So mm. at the core of our philosophy is to say superannuation, it's wealth, it's your money, we want to help you understand it, we're here for you. There's a whole bunch of education initiatives that we're putting around Zupa because yeah. having the technology in your hand and seeing what your balance is doing is one thing. Actually understand 
understanding it is another. Yeah. And so, you know, if we can come into the market and we can be people flying the banner for educating people about their finances, I think that's a really valid and authentic message. And so we're at the moment, we're putting together an event where we want to bring people together to deconstruct some of those taboos that people have around money and talking about it yeah. and kind of getting them empowered to start making awesome decisions. And if that decision isn't super, but it's another fun, but at least they know what they're doing, Great. That's awesome. That's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. We obviously want it to be super, but you know, if we can empower them, we're doing we're doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. we started this business to help people, right? You know, because yeah. we saw what was happening in the industry, and the, when you dig into what's happening in the in the industry and you see what's really going on, it's really not cool. It's really unfair. It's not helping people. It's not doing the thing that superannuation was designed to do, yeah. at least not as well as it could. And um, you know, at its core, superannuation is a brilliant concept. You know, there's markets all over the world that look at Australia and see what's happening with superannuation and, and aspire to model it, whether it's pension schemes in the UK or uh, in other markets. You know, there's there's a uh, fundamental, brilliant core to what superannuation is and how it works. It just hasn't been implemented very well in this country yet. So um, that's what we're capitalizing on. Yeah, and I think it's the, you know, if you look at the, the really well-known fund managers, the, the Neil Kersons and the David Paradise and Wilson and those guys, like they're all hundred, worth hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions in the case of Neil Kerson. Yeah, I think that's his name. Um, and I think there's that fundamental bitterness by people going, how is it that my money has gone up incrementally and at times below an index fun while he keeps getting richer <laughs> you keep getting richer <laughs> yeah. like yeah. billions of dollars richer yeah. and and i think it's a it's it's something that even the most sophisticated person doesn't really understand it just feels like it's a necessary evil well, that's why Zoop is a movement, right? You know, we want to attract people, educate and empower them to then make a difference and make a change and, mm. you know, maybe stop some of that happening, right? Or reduce yeah. the amount that's going to the guys at the top and maybe give a little bit back to the people, you know, a little bit further down the bottom. Who work for it. Who work for it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I mean... We're at the start of that journey. It's going to be a long road. We're under no illusions that it's going to be easy. Mm-hmm. Um, there's an immense amount of apathy about superannuation out in the market, and that's you know benefited the big funds for a very, very long, long time. time. Yeah. Um, but you know, in, in equal measures, they've been just as apathetic about our desire to want to take back control. And yeah. so, you know, if we can capture and tap into that zeitgeist, and I think we can do something really exciting. I really think that superannuation is a wealth product, and there are so many other ways. That we need to be educating people about how to build their wealth outside of superannuation. If you can't get on the housing market, for example, should you just be parking your money in a term deposit or should you be doing something a little bit more interesting with it to actually maximize some of those returns? A lot of people, especially my friends, don't feel comfortable doing that because they kind of don't know where to turn or what products or platforms to use. So there's a really interesting journey and um, kind of ecosystem that we've mapped out internally that says start with super, get people comfortable with investing okay well what about other discretionary wealth products can we play in that space can we work with partners and then all the way down to the end to the short term stuff where you've seen a lot of action in the fintech space globally because it's kind of the easiest bit to chew off yeah. maybe once we've got this awesome base of customers we can start pulling some of those things into our platform yeah. so it's, it's bigger than just super but it is so much about super it's kind of the core and beyond well that is most people's biggest asset you know outside of a lot of Australians certainly the baby boomers Who's pro- who've ridden the property way, but certainly for the millennials, that the superannuation is going to be their biggest investment because a lot of them are going to be blocked out of the the property market unless we have that that much overdue correction that everyone keeps telling me that's not going to happen. But yeah. do you think that people like Facebook will ultimately enter this space too, given given their Two billion and counting active users and the, yeah. the, the trust that those people have in the business. So I, I write a fintech blog and I cover businesses across the world. I'm very connected into the scene. Um, I've been overseas to talk at conferences. And this is a really hot topic. What will the big kind of... Um, 
you know, Apple's, Facebook's, Google's of this world, when will they make a play for banking? Why are they going after the banking sector? And a lot of people will say, banks don't need to worry about fintech. They need to be worried about the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks of this world. Yeah. And I think if you look at what's happening in banking, it's very much getting defragmented, right? So instead of needing a banking license, you can develop a front-end layer and connect into someone else who's got a wholesale banking license. Yeah. And you've already got Facebook rolling out payments inside Messenger. You've got, already got Apple um, with Apple Pay. Oh. And, you know, that's been difficult for them here with the banks essentially blocking them. Mm -hmm. But they're going to get there in the end because consumer demand, you only have to go on Twitter and see everyone tweeting, when can I get Apple Pay, da, 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 da. So I think the way that they will enter into the finance space won't be the traditional path of setting up a platform, getting a license and so on. I think they'll partner. And I think they'll slowly start, start to take bites off the most profitable parts of the banking sector and yeah. payments is, is definitely one of them yeah yeah super super interesting and tell me in terms of where you see investors coming from for Zupa, is it the the retail individual investor or do you see industry funds using your platform um well i mean i'm not, I'm not sure i completely understand the question so so people like say someone like me that has my super now sitting in cash yeah. that i'm paying fees on because it's still caught up in in some rep platform obviously i'm a target like i'm i'm a potential customer because it sounds fantastic but are there also industry super funds that could potentially use that platform and direct money to 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 your app to, right. to your service i should say um, well, f the first part, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Come, come, be part of the, the Zuper movement. Um, in terms of other other superannuation companies, that is not something that we've really talked about in terms of them putting their money into our ETFs or our funds. Yeah. But w one of the things we have talked about is white labeling our back end because okay. um, we are creating and building something that doesn't exist it's in the industry yeah, and it's proprietary yeah. Yeah. and um, you know we had um, we've had a lot of interesting chats with people in the industry bodies like ASFA for example and who are very excited uh, to see disruptors coming in they've always they, in their words they've said we always knew it would come from outside the industry because mm -hmm. they admittedly you know know that their own industry is, is one of those ones I talked about earlier about being too big too stuck too old to kind of adapt and change quickly to the way the world works now and so we have, you know, we have talked about that as being a possibility, like okay. we could white label our platform for them to help them um, communicate and uh, educate and, and uh, inform and inspire their own customers. Yeah. Uh, and look, it's just a, it's a huge market. You know, uh, there's opportunity for all of us to... Um, to help lots of people, right? And if you look at some of the other players that you mentioned earlier, we don't actually see them as our competition, right? Mm -hmm. We we're look we're going after big supers. It's a two point three trillion dollar industry, right? Yeah. Um, those other little guys that are coming in alongside us. Um, all they do is, is just to create more more conversation, more people talking about it, and yeah. that's really that's great for everyone. Right? Yeah, mm. I tell you the, the the interesting opportunity for you guys is that six hundred ninety odd million in self managed super fund because you know I look at my dad who he's a he's a retired medical doctor he, he's lucky to even know what a bank he is let alone how to manage his money and you know for his whole career he had it with a, a financial advisor that and, and then lost a boot full of money like you were talking about before Jess during the GFC so my brother and I manage that for him but it's very passive in so far as the time we allocate to that and he's paying and got the compliance burden of, of having this self-managed super fund and all the accounts and tax returns and things that the opportunity to direct money to your fund. So, do, would you would would you be required to have a, a registered self managed super fund to direct money to you, or could anyone just individually do it without setting up that structure? That's an interesting question. I don't actually think I know the exact answer to it. I mean, that would be an interesting, yeah, a really interesting one. Yeah, I mean the typical and investor or member that's going to be coming to us will be coming out of an industry yeah. or a retail Well, that probably fund. answers the question. Yeah. So that probably means you don't yeah. need to have a self-managed super fund to, to direct money towards you. 
No, no, you don't. Anyone okay. in Australia. No, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's just, it just as Erin said, people have said, oh, this is like a self-managed super because I've thought about maybe doing it, but, you know, because you're letting yourself direct a little bit of it. I think that's the big thing. People have flooded into self-managed super because they want to self-direct. Yeah. They want to have more say over where their money goes and they believe that they have the capability to make that choice. Now, with what we're doing is we're saying, we're going to let you make that choice, but you don't have to go through all the hurdles of becoming your own trustee and setting up your own estimates. It's torture. It's torture. And, you know, at a certain um, balance level, it's completely uneconomical. Yeah. And so why not come to a business like Zupa that's giving you all the benefits of choice with none of the hurdles of compliance? Yeah. Well, I do think there are a bunch of people out there like my dad that, that have no active involvement in it, have no appetite for it, have no knowledge of it, but are paying the, the cost and the time yeah. that you go, you know what, just yeah. fold the self-managed super fund, park the money there yeah. and be done with it. Because an accountant or a financial advisor got a consulting fee out of oh, recommending yeah. they go into it, right? Yeah, of course yeah. they do. And then they get to do yeah. the accounts and the tax returns yeah, every correct. year. And yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of a rot, to be honest, oh, to think about it. Rot. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the things we talk about when we when we talk about who we're focused on is we call them sort of the anxious generation, right? And part of that is is around this cycle that we see where people, as just said, they're successful in their lives. They have great jobs. They can afford to live uh, in, in wonderful apartments and they can go out to dinner and they can, you know, go take holidays. Um, but they, uh, and they've never been more satisfied in their professional and personal lives. Yeah. But they, and, but they will admittedly, like we do our research, like 26% of them feel like they're doing a good job with their money. Don't feel like Don't, I'm, I'm doing good yeah, yeah. So, so, no, it's the other way. The most, more, oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah. People <laughs> feel like they're not doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Most people, right? So they have, they're living these, on the, on the outside, they're living these wildly successful um, lives, but inside they know that they're not actually doing the things they should be doing. And so what, so the reason we kind of arrived at this term anxious generation mm-hmm. is because they know they should do something, right? We all know we should be doing more with our money. We know we should probably look at our superannuation, but it's so boring and so dull and so difficult up until now to do anything that they don't. But they, and so they, they so they should get help, but they don't trust banks mm-hmm. and they don't trust financial advisors or they don't want to talk to some old person about their money who they feel is out of touch, right? Yeah. And they don't trust them themselves yeah so they don't do anything but they know they should do something and it's niggling there you know but they don't do it because and that just loop just keeps going around and around and time you know another year goes by you don't do anything about your super another year goes by you don't do anything about your super and so what zuber is doing is trying to inject a little bit of education insight inspiration um, into that broken cycle and break that cycle right so that people can kind of start going oh right and be empowered be informed yeah uh, and be a you know, just a little bit more engaged. You know, we say five minutes a month is enough, right? You don't have to like become a financial wizard to be good at managing your superannuation. Five minutes a month to check in on using our app and just see how things are going, make a few easy, simple decisions, and you're on your way. You can be set up much better than you probably are right now. Yeah. I know it's a really interesting, you know, I've had a guy that's managed my money for a long time and, and I respect him and he's a, he's a, he's an honest guy and a, he's a smart guy and, you know, I'm not sure he's that much smarter than me, so I always wonder why I'm paying the fee. But, you know, he always used to say to me, I only look at your super once a year. And I go, are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> why is that I don't realise you're doing a really shit job for 364 days a year? You know, and he goes, no, it's like it's a time. Like it's, and I, and I kind of get that. There are ebbs and flows and cycles and diversified portfolios, but... I also do think that the, the problem is that when you want to make a decision and you want to make it nimbly, and I think it's one of the great benefits of what you're doing, is that you get stuck with, like with what I've done recently. In times when times are good, like let alone if, if, if you had another GFC and people really wanted to and needed to move quickly and yeah. you know governments and all the kinds of bureaucrats would get involved and stop the run on money <laughs> because they, they, they're worried about the, the financial system collapsing. They're not worried about the the poor people who've lost all their money. You know, I think that that nimbleness is an incredible feature for for a lot of people. 
Yeah, I mean, it's super exciting to think about where Zupa could go in the future. So with these tilts, we're giving people the opportunity to actually have an impact with where their money is invested. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about superannuation being such a driver of the economy and, you know, funding a lot of awesome businesses and infrastructure in Australia and even globally. But what if it was funding even better businesses? You know, what if we were putting our money into things that were, you know, essentially helping us create the future that we want to live Mm -hmm. in and the future we want for our kids? I think for me personally, that's a really big driver of why I'm in Zupa working with these guys and making this product happen because I think it's about time that we kind of said it's our money let's make sure it's making an impact let's make sure that it's invested in companies that are actually trying to create a difference and make a better world and it sounds really big but it's actually achievable you know we can break it down and we can allow you to do that just by rolling into Zupa so it doesn't have to be this big hairy audacious unachievable goal it can be this really tactical tangible thing that you can do just by switching your super provider yeah it's pretty amazing like when we were doing our research the amount of people who didn't even realize that uh, their superannuation is their money right it's shocking right, right? I mean, what is so, they, they well I think it's like a tax you know or it just goes out you know just, just comes out of their paycheck I kind of get that you know back to you the know? analogy of my girlfriend last night watching the, 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 the insider movie I think that that would be her assumption also yeah you know, never looks at it yeah, we don't think about it. Yeah, you know? so yeah, that, that's 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 a real shame, you know. Mm. And I think that you know we're trying to change yeah. that. Yeah, and th- this ongoing argument about high conviction active fund managers versus low cost index funds and the incredible flow of, of money from one to the other over the course of the last few years. What's your take on it? You know, I, and Jess, I think you alluded to it before that there are a percentage of, of fund managers that do an incredible, incredibly good job. You know, I'm not sure over a, an extended period of time necessarily, but you know, is is there a view that you, we're going to continue to see the the number of active fund managers decrease, or do you think the it, it, it will recreate itself and probably steal some of your concepts and ideas over the course of the coming years? Look, I think we will definitely have a shakeout. So to your point earlier around the index huggers, I think their time has pretty much come to an end. I think if you look at the fundamentals of what's happening in the economy broadly, data is the key to everything now and Mm. data is driving a lot of decisions and data driving decisions doesn't have to have a human sitting there Um, making those decisions at the same time because often the data driving decisions is better and I think that's where you're seeing a lot of the movement to passive because ultimately you're using data and leveraging that to essentially make better investment decisions, diversify risk understand the macro picture around you know the volatility element of where things are going. So I think it's going to get more sophisticated, there will always be room for human ingenuity in investing and you'll always have a couple of people that can see further ahead, they're those really visionary people and then I think you'll get this really interesting kind of active passive hybrid blend you know we're kind of probably at the start of the passive journey it's really simple etf products right replicate the index or part of the index i think it's going to get even more sophisticated and we've already had discussions with some people that are really rethinking the kind of whole way that we do asset allocation using these sorts of products so i think we're at the start of the journey i think it's going to get a lot more sophisticated with data um still still room for some active managers the really really good ones but I think you've got to look at where the industry is heading and if you ignore it like some of the commentators do because they're trying to protect the industry they work in I think you're on the wrong side of history yeah it's a really interesting argument though that the active fund managers and I take as an example integrity which I know because Paul Fiani who's the head of that I went to university with and you know he set up that business coming out of UBS on the back of actively being against the the sale of Qantas to private equity, I think it was. I think it was private equity. Anyway, and and that was the the conviction that he stood by and on top on on the back of that he raised up to five I think it was five point seven billion dollars at one point in time and, you know, build a team and all and never really returned anything to shareholders over the course investors or shareholders over the course of the next six or seven years. And so his fund's gone from five point seven to thirty five million. Five point seven billion to thirty five million this year. You know, and I go the, the human element of that fund and one guy's arrogance and self-belief and high conviction or whatever you want to call it 
really has been to the detriment of investors. Well, shareholders, I won't say that, in the, the investors into that fund. Yeah, but he still got paid. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and back to the human thing, that there is that very, very small percentage of people that, that, that truly commit their lives to it and they look after themselves and they focus on it. But there are a lot of people in that industry that still do long lunches, still don't necessarily focus on what they're doing, have long holidays every year, and how that can compete with artificial intelligence or, or data, I'm, I'm just not sure. Well, I don't think it can. I don't think a large portion of it can and it's not prepared to and that's where we have a distinct advantage because A, we're building things from scratch and B, we think very differently. I think to your point about the long lunches and you know that whole environment and you're shrouded in, in this mystique, a big element about Zuka is that whole democratization. You should be able to access investment products at a low price. You should be able to grow your wealth just like the old boys club have been able to do, right? Yeah. You shouldn't have to know the right people and have the right connections to get wealth Wealth generation should be for everybody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And do you think back to the the property issue that we have in Australia, and particularly with the the younger generation, the millennials and Generation Z or whatever they're calling them now, that we're going to start to see investment products that give people access to investing in residential property through units or tri- units or shares, or whatever it happens to be. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, certainly we're looking at ways we can develop our own property fund. Um, uh, We know it's a hot topic and it's a a pain point and a passion point for people in our audience. You mentioned earlier, you know, uh, most people right now uh, can't afford to buy a house in Sydney, you know, Mm -hmm. or maybe anywhere in Australia. You know, the housing market's gone bananas. And that that used to be the foundation of, uh, you know, wealth creation in this country. Yeah. And right now, anyway, it, it's impossible for a lot of people to jump in. So they're going to have to be paying more attention and making smarter decisions and getting a little bit more educated about what they're going to do with the money that they would otherwise mm-hmm. invest in property. Um, we are aware of some products already in the market that are really interesting, but mm-hmm. we are not ready to announce what our own product will be. Yeah, you know, awesome. Yeah. And what's the, the timeline now to official launch? Well, we're recording this was the first week of July, right? So we're anticipating that we'll be um, in market sometime in August. Yeah, yeah. and and the target initial funds under management. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we, we've got a lot of targets. Yeah. Getting to a hundred million would be a great first initial target, yeah, and then awesome. moving upwards from there. I mean, kind of the world's our oyster, I think, at the moment, and we'll have a pretty good feeling for our run rate and our traction once yeah. the first three months are done and dusted. Yeah, awesome. And there's a there's a wait list, yeah. There's a wait list, yeah. So we've been very lucky to like you know through our network to generate some awesome PR, and you know we're in the conversation, we're there, we're attending events, we've been asked to speak. Just through that, over a thousand, continue to grow it. We've just on, brought on board our first official kind of growth hacker, a guy called Juan. He's amazing. So he's completely reinventing our marketing stack and taking that to a point where right, we're ready to really hone in on our target, amplify building that wait list, and then get ready for launch. Yeah, so the idea is, like like just said, our, our wait list went to 1,000 people really quickly. It's continuing to grow every day. In August, when we launch, it won't probably be a, uh, a wide beta. It'll be a beta, right? So mm-hmm. we'll probably take a couple hundred people off that wait list, yeah. run them through, make sure we've worked out all the kinks. And, family and, and friends and, kind of, yeah. yeah. A, a little, a little <laughs> two, we might have 200 family and friends yeah. between all of us. <laughs> yeah, um, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the idea is that um, we'll test and learn with a small group, make sure everything's sweet uh, before we go really big and hard. And, yeah. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, where we're at right now in the phase of this, we're doing our Series A right now. And cool. a big part of that raise will be about um, um, uh, getting our customer acquisition cost down and then using that funding to, to grow. Yeah, awesome. And uh, the platforms that you'll look to growth hack and things are millennial focus, like social media. Yeah, I mean, there's no silver bullet. You kind of have to be in everywhere. the right place at the right time. So yeah. a lot of the genius behind your marketing stack is building something that can do that 
and automate that and then deliver it at scale. So, you know, yeah, we want to essentially know everything about our customers as much as we can from the interactions that they have with us on all our platforms and then guide them to the point where they're ready to make a a decision to roll over. So a lot of that is understanding all those different things that stop them from rolling over today or switching or make them apathetic and then tapping into that and helping them overcome or explain why that shouldn't be a problem or here's why Zuper makes it easier. So it's it's a very big journey and then layered into that we're working with a guy called Chris Wyatt so he's our behavioral um, scientist nicknaming him our chief behavioral officer and you know a lot of a lot of the intelligence behind how you use a marketing stack is driven by deeply understanding why people behave the way they do yeah. and how those behaviors stop them from doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole bunch of things that we're working with him to bake in. So understanding optimism bias, hyperbolic discounting, framing, all these things that mm-hmm. we don't really, they're, they're, they're big kind of jazzy words, but yeah, you know, we, we encounter them every day when we make decisions, especially about our finances. Yeah, and do you think that, once you do have people invested in, in your fund that, again, on the behavioural side, there's going to need to be an education piece for people in so far as understanding the market and the cycles of the market so that they Definitely. don't become knee-jerk and pull money Absolutely. out. Absolutely. It's a really interesting one. So there's a, uh, an outfit in New Zealand called Simplicity, and yeah. they're essentially trying to kind of do what we're doing and they've been very successful at it for KiwiSaver, which is the equivalent of superannuation in New Zealand. KiwiSaver is a very new thing though it hasn't been around it's not as mature as superannuation and I met them I was at their we just got a hundred million party in in Auckland um, earlier in the year and I was talking to them about that exact problem and they said one of the things that they actively try to do be it right or wrong I'm not sure but you know they've gone there and I think it's working for them is when the market does dip they go out to their investors and they say now is not the time to panic now is the time to think about buying because if you were you know this is how a savvy investor would think they would see opportunities and bargains. Yeah. So rather than um, just sitting back and not saying anything and hoping that no one notices that the market's crashed or taken a bit of a dip for whatever yeah. reason, go out there, talk about it and say, can we flip the way that you think? Yeah. Can we get you to think more like a strategic investor would think? And I, I really respect that because I think that's a great example mm-hmm. of education. And even if it's like, even if it's, even if those people can't like jump in and, and buy I had a bargain like just said it's still the message is don't freak out this is a long game yeah. you know markets go up markets go yeah. down over time they go up you're going to be fine just yeah. ride the storm out you know and I think that's you know again to unsophisticated investors that can be a very uh, scary time it can be an opportunity but regardless of which way you see it long term you're going to be alright yeah and do you think and this is a probably more a personal question that that we will see some form of of major correction again not necessarily of gfc proportions but do you think we've actually learned a lot from what happened back in 2007 8 9 or cuz my, my my sense is that that we we haven't necessarily and that, that there is still underlying problems with with personal leverage and you know the sophistication of the of the finance industry in terms of these derivative products and things that that we will once again have to have a major correction. Yeah, look, I, I think Jess and I would have different answers here. I will just say I'm no Nostradamus. Like I'm not going to make a, <laughs> a bold prediction here uh, that I can be held accountable for. Uh, what I will, you know, my gut feeling is that the property market is going to is going to need some readjustment you know, mm-hmm. probably very soon we're already seeing interest rates going up on especially on investment properties so that might have a, an interesting effect on the market but uh, yeah I don't, I don't think I want to make any strong predictions yeah. about um, yeah again I'm no Nostradamus either <laughs> it'd be nice if I was and I could make those bets now mm-hmm. and cash in later but uh yeah, I mean, sitting where I'm sitting, that the ASX hasn't really performed this year, so it's struggling, right? You know, it, yeah. it hasn't really kick-started, and there's a lot of people going into cash, like you said. You know, I know a few people in the finance sector mm-hmm. that, that are doing that at the moment. Yeah. Um, well, it's had a good run since January 2016, where it yeah. really capitulated. Yeah. But since then, it's had a really good run. It's still not back to where it was yeah. in 2006. Yeah. 
11 years later. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, and I think now's probably the time to be diversified, right? So yeah. don't be too strong in one particular sector um, because it's really hard to make bets, but spread your risk and just be prepared and make sure that you're um, in the most um, advantageous position by paying the less fees. So I think, you know, that's where those index products are interesting. Yeah, yeah especially yeah. with, like, again, going back to our product that we're building, you know, you're going to have multiple types of funds you can invest in to diversify. Uh, all our funds are unitized, so you can choose one, two, or three of our funds at launch. So uh, we'd probably advise people not to put all their money into something, into one thing. Like, don't put all your money only into tech right now. Yeah. Um, put it into tech if you love tech, but maybe put it into green uh, mm. technology or put it into health and well-being or yeah. just uh, straight up growth. Yeah. So. But we'd never advise them because we don't offer personal advice. That's right. yeah. We offer general advice. Yeah. So we wouldn't, you know, and that's a really important fundamental. At the end of the day, we'll present all the information, but we won't du- direct people anywhere. Yeah. It's ultimately their choice with the information at hand. And is the intention to have a fee structure for retail and wholesale, say for like the self-managed super funds as an example, that have Five hundred thousand dollars is an arbitrary figure, potentially, but not yeah. off the bat. Off so the at the bat, moment, it's purely same. for you know people like us that have our money, not in an SMSF, yeah, yeah coming Just across from a retailer across. industry fund. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. cool. And the brand proposition, you know, I know like the words, the the, the names, great, and but what is is there a real probably Erin, this is your background. Is there a real brand strategy that to get through this clutter of of you know, the 300 plus superannuation funds out there. And you know, like- sure, I mean, you know, the the brand is unique. That's by design, literally and figuratively. Uh, you know, someone once said, you know, when the mar- when people are zigging, make sure you zag. Yeah. And there's a reason why Zuper doesn't sound or look like anyone else in the space. Mm. Uh, you know, and we're trying to. That's that's why you know we're trying to get people to engage, right? And so how do you try and get people's attention in an industry they don't really care that much about, that they're not that interested in, that they already mm-hmm. think is boring and lame and not fun, right? Yeah. So so how can we do that? So we can do that by injecting some levity. We can inject do that by um, using a tone of voice that relate that's relatable and understandable by removing all the acronyms and the terminology. Yeah. Um, by um, being a little bit playful without being uh, doing anything to come across as potentially untrustworthy, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's some people who've come into the space who've done stuff that doesn't make me want to, that doesn't make me think they're trustworthy or mm. you know, with money. Yeah, um, right. And so uh, it's a fine it's a fine balance between um, being a really wonderful consumer facing technology brand. And also playing within the rules of the industry in terms of what you can say and what you can't say. Yeah. Just for a very good point, we're not financial advisors. We can surface information and we can uh, help people make smart decisions, but we'll never be in a position to tell you what to do. And, you know, it, earlier in the conversation, we talked about all the regulatory partners that are that have to fall into place to do something like this mm-hmm. with trustee asset consultants and administrators and the like. It's the same thing with it when you're creating a brand in this space. Uh, the industry is very, very um, protective of itself yeah. and uh, is designed to ensure that people can't come out and make claims or use misleading language or, uh, you know, talk to, talk to people in a way that might be misleading. So, yeah. so there's a lot of stuff that we're doing to kind of, to, to make sure that we're playing within the rules, but still keep people engaged, keep people excited, and, and track them to what we're doing. Yeah, and I think it's good too because my understanding of if you look at someone like a Vanguard, that you need to be a self-managed super fund to actually be able to invest directly into that. You know, so you're clearly differentiated in the marketplace from from people like that that are seeing an incredible inflow of, of money. Yeah, there are some products in the core of our portfolio that you would have to have 50 to 100K to actually be able to make an investment and in direct yep. yourself. Yep. But through us, you know, through the economies yeah, of scale, so, we're yeah. able to deliver that. So I think that's pretty cool. It's super exciting. Yeah. And the the way list and things is still open. Can people yep. contact you with the, the, all the details up in the show yeah. notes? Absolutely. Zupa.com.au. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're having a lot of fun. We're really excited. We want to help a lot of people. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And we should come back every year and do a show and 
Every month. Every month. <laughs> <laughs> Every month. This is a new platform. Yeah. Uh, well, if, if, if you don't mind, we'll take this opportunity to plug our own podcast. <laughs> Are you going Sunday? Uh, we're, yeah, we're creating a new podcast right now. I think I mentioned earlier that we kind of have this uh, – this belief inside our business that five minutes a month is enough time for people to really make an impactful change in their yeah. future by paying attention to their super for that small amount of time. So uh, our podcast is going to be a monthly podcast and it's going to be five minutes long. Nice. Uh, and each month there will be uh, sort of evergreen information that um, people can uh, use to make smart, informed decisions about their financial future. Powerful. You know, and I think, again, the, the trends around the way people like to be educated and learn is very much video and podcasting I think it's you know certainly for me personally it's it's the way that I learn these days I wish I could go back and not do school and just, <laughs> yeah. just work and just watch the podcast yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, think, I do I think there's an enormous disruption coming to, to higher education very very quickly oh, that's, yeah. that's a whole other topic it is a whole other topic yeah. so we might park that but really interesting stuff guys and I'm looking forward to it awesome well cool. thank you so much yeah, thanks, thanks for having me no yeah. problems Thank you.